though, that we need to consider. And we need to consider that as we project forward into other unexpected uh, uh, type threats and threat and capabilities we have to protect against. To deliver this, uh, this instructional period, instructional period uh, in Jones today, we have two of our finest. We have Dr. George Stein, who's going to, to begin the lecture, setting the uh, stage, and then uh, followed up by Buck Grinner, or Dr. Buck Grinner, who is going to uh, tantalize you with a, a possible scenario that uh, we may have to think about. So with that, Dr. Stein. Uh, a, a word to the uh, a, a word to the wise. Um, every three years, the Chinese military throws a conference on Sun Tzu, and you write a paper and apply to go. I went six years ago. I wrote a paper and applied to go this year. Um, and the people that do the passports and visas for your RS trips screwed it up completely, and so I didn't get to go to the conference on how Sun Tzu would attack Taiwan. Uh, so my word of advice is anybody working the visa problem for the RS trip, start well ahead of time. Which button do you push? The one that says forward? Yes. OK, here's where we are. Uh, in, in our war fighting course, we're going to be looking at the idea of a near peer. Now, do we mean something technological or operational? Um, no, as a matter of fact, we don't. What we're looking at, that uh, what we'll call the O2s, O3s, and O4s, um, may be a problem for us precisely because they think differently or theref and therefore may fight differently. So I'm going to talk about two things that are different for most of us. How the Chinese traditionally strategically think, which is a different model because they live in a different universe. And we're going to talk about information operations, information warfare, because that's a different way of conducting operations for most of us. So trying to put Chinese thinking and information warfare together uh, gives you a double uh, red team uh, approach to this. Yep. Or do I have to point it? What do, what do you do? I press forward and nothing happens. There we go. Is, is it a signal or does it work automatically? Okay. Well, if, if we looked at the Chinese, we would see that in one sense, they're very much like us. That is, that they talk about information warfare and, and warfare in the information age kind of in a technological fashion like us. And they also have their own particular political issues like, you know, keeping, uh, coming up with treaties to keep Google from finding any sites critical of the government when you do a Google search from inside China. Uh, and they want kind of arms control agreements on the use of cyberspace. That's silly. It's not going to work. And they obviously do some strategic thinking about this. The strategic thinking falls into three categories. One of it's pretty much like ours. In other words, they worry about command and control warfare. They worry about dis distributed decision making. Uh, they call it anti-pagoda. We call it anti-hierarchical. In other words, the flattening of the communication system. Some thinking is quite radical, on the other hand, uh, and we'll get back to that. And there's actually some new thinking that combines um, the idea of information dominance, information warfare, and unrestricted warfare that came out following 911. So the key points for red teaming people, we have to be very careful of mirror imaging. We can be misled by a similar vocabulary. Uh, on the assumption that you did the readings for today, you know in that last reading that when they talk about information warfare and we talk about information warfare, they're talk we're talking about two different things. 
well, expand that into other areas that we have to worry about and think about. What do the Chinese think about the weaponization of space? Do they mean weaponization the same way we do, etc.? These are the things a red team person has to worry about. And one of the problems that leads us to mirror imaging is that most of the, you know, when you translate it into English, you put it into our kinds of standard words, and then it seems very derivative and a very cheap Asian copy and not really clever, etc. And this, this was really evident when uh, we managed to translate uh, Kiao and Wang's book, Unrestricted Warfare, several years ago. You may remember that. Uh, there were a lot of people who focused on the idea, gee, they're talking about terrorism, um, because that was what was on our mind. Uh, and that's not what they were talking about. They were actually talking about a return to very traditional Chinese strategic thinking. Sun Tzu, the Taikong, other people like that, pretty much abandoned the Clausewitz and, more importantly, uh, the Mao model. And that was a weird book, published in 99, must have been written in 98. A couple professors at a Chinese PME institution like this. Um, and, there's, and, they're, and they're writing, there's this guy out there called Osama bin Laden. And he's got a really interesting way that he thinks he's going to take on the United States. This guy deserves watching for the new tactics, techniques, and procedures he's developing. This is, in, this is in 99, 98. So a couple of Chinese professors connected the dots. Forward. That's an odd statement. What do I mean by that? If I had a theory of magic... You know, I waved my magic wand and rabbits jumped out of hats. The universe would have to have hats with rabbits in it because otherwise the theory wouldn't work. All right, so what does the world have to be like for the theory describing it to be seen as true? That's, a, that's an odd question. Forward. So the Chinese thesis quite possibly live in a different strategic world than we do. And the sub-thesis is, and this is the important point, that the Chinese world is much closer to the information age world than it is the industrial age world. And so the Chinese th thinking about info war meshes with the world as it is organized in the information age quite well. So a little bit of philosophy here. Forward. We in the West are fundamentally dualistic. Right? We have a creator and the created, or being and becoming, forms and flux. Essence and accident, theory and practice, natural law, situation, ethics, the strategy model and the problem to be solved, etc. That is, we have this idea, going back to Archimedes, that if we can step outside of the universe and look down on it, then we can figure things out. All right? The Chinese don't live in that universe, or the East in general doesn't live in that universe. For the East... The universe is what it is, a universe, a one thing. We are in it. What is, is. Neither we humans nor anything else stand outside of existence. We're part of the flow. Right. And it's all just energy or mass. That's why they're in quotation marks. It's, it's all just key. You know, like, Tai Chi, the exercise Chi, it's, it, it's all just Chi. It's either kind of Chi in invisible form like energy and Chi in solidified form like mass. But it's all we, we are all, we're all part of that. It's all one big ball of wax. Forward. This is a hard sentence. But 
So the state or configuration of the universe at any one time, they call the Tao, the way. Thus, we are, in quotation marks, in a particular state or condition now, and we are in a particular state or condition then. There's no, there's no, there's no such, there's nothing like an individual person. We are a particular set of relationships at a particular time and place. You might think you're, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, but when Lieutenant Colonel Jones is dealing with the captain, it's an entirely different attitude and behavior than when he is dealing with the general. And when you deal with your wife, it's an entirely different set of relationships. If it's not, you're going to get a divorce. But it's when you're dealing with your children, you're a parent. When you're dealing with your parents, you're a child. So the appropriate behavior at any one time is determined by the context. Context is everything. Forward. One of our previous DFW speakers <clears throat> might have actually had a Chinese insight. Chinese would agree with that completely. War is not a thing by itself. War has to be discussed and thought about in the context of everything else. And we, and we might actually have had a Chinese, quote-unquote, Air Force general. Next slide. This is a famous story. Air Force general was probably more correct than he realized when he answered an annoyed Army general's question, what's Air Force doctrine on? And the Air Force guy said, it depends. And that's very true about you know, well, yeah, what we're going to do depends on the situation. And that's a very good insight. Next. So, this is a bit confusing, but it'll become clear. So, the state or configuration of the universe at any one time is called the Tao. Everything that's in the universe then participates in this and has its own Tao, its own way of doing things. Sun Tzu... 2,500 years ago, starts off his book, Warfare is the Greatest Affair of State, the Basis of Life and Death, the Tao of Survival or, or Extinction. In other words, it's the most important thing we humans do, is study warfare, because it's what makes us alive or dead. Remember, they're not going to heaven. Right? It's this world we're in. Okay? Next. So, the study of warfare as the way of survival or extinction, the basis of life and death, is the study or the figuring out or the navigating of the Tao of warfare. But Sun Tzu tells us the Tao of warfare is deception. Right? The fundamental essence, if you will, what war is about is deception. Next. So, you've all undoubtedly sometime at an appropriate time in your military education read some Sun Tzu. If you didn't, you're deficient. He starts off, these are some of, you know, these are quite familiar, right? Display and capability, go where they don't expect you, attack when they're not prepared, etc., etc., it's kind of like Colin Gray said in the article, you know, there's nothing about asymmetry. Anybody that read Sun Tzu understands the notion of asymmetry. It's 2,500 years old. But Sun Tzu tells us that these are the ways military strategists are victorious, mastering deception. Next. But these are the ways military strategists are victorious. They cannot be spoken of in advance. He says, why? 
because for the Chinese, the, contact, the conduct of war, like the conduct of your relations with your relatives, right, is radically contextual, situational, relational. There are no a priori limits on the means for conducting war. Surprise attacks, good in this case, good surprise attack. There are no a priori boundaries to the domain of war. If creating refugees is what we need to do, create refugees. The answer is how are the Chinese going to fight? It depends. Next. So for 2,500 years, Chinese strategy, grand strategy has been the same. Subjugate the enemy without battle. In other words, what's the point of inheriting a smoking ruin? Right? Capture the cities without siege. Destroy the enemy state without prolonged fighting. Sun Tzu tells us no state has ever profited from a long war. Uh, in essence, try to take the state intact. Okay, how do they do this? How would a Chinese strategist think? Next. We usually begin on the outside with an ideal as the standard or reference point to discuss the quote-unquote realities of empirical battles. We look at doctrine. We look at military history. Sun Tzu tells us you can't learn anything from looking backwards. The Chinese begin inside with what are the unique empirical constellations of relationships informing, making real, this conflict. So they ask, which general is more competent? Which side has the better airplanes? Which side has the better trained soldiers? Which side compared to us? So it's, it's, the planning is radically contextual. Next. And Sun Tzu develops, if you will, a very interesting strategy model. He said there are five things you have to consider, us and them. The Tao, which in this particular case means the morale of the, do the people support the government? Or as he puts it, are they willing to die for the king? All right. the, how's our side's morale versus their side's morale? Tian, heavens, that is, what, is what, what side has the advantages of the natural environment, the season, at, you know, at such storm? D, earth, terrain, who's got the ter- army guys like that one? Who's got the terrain advantage? Who's got the, who's got the uh, logistics advantage? Uh, Jiang is the military leadership, whose officers are better trained, whose officers are better educated, whose officers are respected by their men better. Um, And uh, fa, which we would translate as organized, trained, and equipped, uh, who, who, which sides got their act together as an army. You compare these five things against your adversary at this time in this place, and then you decide to attack your first you try to disrupt the adversary's strategy failing that you attack his alliances alliances could be his logistical system in other words his combat forces depend on his logistics train therefore disrupt the logistics chain is disrupting the alliance attack his military forces if you have to and you know if everything else fails then go ahead and attack the civil society. Now, how would this look from an info war perspective? Next. I'm going to run through this real quick. You can play with it a little more upstairs. Relative to our strength and weaknesses, how would we use info ops or info war in this context to attack the adversary morale and popular support aiming at his strategy. 
Uh, do people really believe there are weapons of mass destruction? Or they, what are they? How, how might we use info war to disrupt the morale and support of his population and his alliances? Disrupt the alliances? Turn it against the military. Turn it against civil society. Next. Again. How would we use how would we use this to attack his situational awareness based on his mastery of the natural environment? What info ops could we mount against the situational awareness of his alliances, his allies? Because if they're getting one message and he's getting another, we will disrupt the alliance. You just kind of work through this thing. How would we disrupt his advantages of terrain, etc.? Next, his officers, the leadership or the leadership in the info war context, the, the leadership decision support info systems. How do we disrupt the strategy? How do we disrupt the alliances? You can actually make a big matrix and fill in these charts. Next, army, you know, how, how, would, how, how would we use info war, info ops in this context to attack his command and control system or the comm system supporting his power projection in a way that disrupts his strategy or disrupts his alliances or makes it harder for his military to operate or disrupts his civil society, in other words, the port of Los Angeles begins to have problems. The labor unions go out on strike because, you know, old Wang Ho has been a labor organizer down there for 30 years waiting for this day. And you can substitute whatever military thing you want in this for info ops and info war. All right? It's just that you march through this thing in its context, anything, you know, put space up there. How do we use space in this context at this time to disrupt his alliances, etc.? It's next. Do they really think like this? Yes. This, I encourage you to read the book Unrestricted Warfare. You can download it, print it, what they mean by unrestricted warfare is modified combined war that goes beyond limits. It does not mean that there are no limits. Rather, it means that the Chinese or any weak party is not required to accept the ROE defined by the powerful party. I mean, what gives us the right to decide the rules by which war will be fought so it's to our advantage? We reject that. But we only reject the ROE dependent on the situation or the context. Sometimes it's going to be nice to have them take care of our prisoners of war. Sometimes it might be necessary to massacre the prisoners. It depends. What's the context? What's the situation? So Chinese strategic thinking is war in the context of everything else. Next. So you conduct war state to state. But you also involve supranational things as much as you can. Drag the UN in. Drag the International Atomic Energy Agency in. Drag God knows what. I mean, you know, drag international law in. Appeal to the Geneva Convention. You know, do, do something supranational. Attack the enemy using supranational institutions out there. Attack the enemy using transnational such things like big business. Hey, Walmart, do you really want to get into an argument with China and have your entire business go down the tubes because 97% of everything in Walmart is made in China? You know, that's transnational. Do you want, do you want do you want us to call in all the federal debt we've bought from you and start a depression? 
All right? No, we don't do that. <laughs> they do. Non-state. We can make it so difficult that the international NGOs, Médecins Sans Frontières and Red Cross and stuff, all pack up and go home. We can manipulate the non-state actors to achieve our aims. There is no domain in which war cannot be fought. And therefore, there is no domain in which info war will not be fought. And this next list is not my list. This next list is from the Chinese. This is where they plan to fight us. Next. That's war everything else. And any one of those would be analyzed in terms of its impact upon their strategy, its impact upon their alliances, its impact upon their military, its impact upon their civil society. Because everything's connected to everything else. It's one universe. It's all interrelated. And this is the way you conduct war. There are people, for example, I guess they're right-wing fanatics, who are really bent out of shape that the Chinese have bought up large numbers of warehouses at both ends of the Panama Canal. Of course, we think it's just business. Next. So, back to our original question. What must the world be like for the theory describing it to be seen as true? Next. Some final thoughts here. Is it possible that the Chinese strategists, both traditional and modern, live in a different world than we do? I think we could argue that they do. The information domain where everything is interconnected and knowledge is situational, that in fact exists. That's how we define the information age. That's what transformation depends on. That's what dominant battle space knowledge depends on. That's what full spectrum, you know, it all depends on this stuff being true. So the question is, I advance as a hypothesis, does the world in which info war will be fought is that closer to the world the way the Chinese view it or the way we traditionally view it in military terms? You know, is it, I advance just as something for you to argue about, is it possible that this style of red thinking might be better prepared for 21st century combat, 21st century warfare? Next. So, right, so traditional Chinese strategists live in a world where everything is interconnected, knowledge is transitory, situational, radically contextual. So the question is, is warfare in the information age likely to be fought in an information domain where everything is interconnected and knowledge is transitory, situational, and radically contextual? Next. So some contemporary Chinese strategists see this war fighting space as having no boundaries, no limits. War is fought in the everything else, not in the traditional battle space as defined by us in our ROE. What is an enemy combatant as opposed to a prisoner of war? That's not a big problem. So the question is, right, what are the boundaries of warfare in the information age when everything is interconnected and knowledge, dominant battle space knowledge, is transitory, situational, and radically contextual? So next, 
A couple of questions then for you to argue and think about upstairs. Do the Chinese quite possibly live in a different strategic world than us? I would argue that they do. Uh, some of you might be lucky enough to have someone in your seminar that set through the Sun Tzu course. They can help out here. Does the Chinese strategic world seem more appropriate for an information age than an industrial age world? And thus, quite relevant to a world in which info war would likely be fought. Especially info war as described in the article you read in the readings. It's a very different view of what info war is. So then the last question. Next. Should we, as war fighters, expect no limits, no boundaries, in a Chinese approach to info ops and info war? Are we going, this is a red team exercise. How will we deal with an adversary who quite possibly thinks differently and fights differently by a whole different model of how the universe works and a whole different model of strategy? That's the red team question. Not so much, I mean, China's the example, but you know, what if their five rings aren't the five rings? What if their, we do this center of gravity analysis, what if they think something else is the center of gravity? Right. Just because that's the way we do it does not necessarily mean that's the way they do it. Sun Tzu said, victory belongs to us, defeat belongs to the adversary. That is, only the enemy can decide when he's beat. He's either dead or he surrenders. And it's his decision as to whether he surrenders. And I think we're discovering that to our horror right now. Okay, I'll stop well within the time limit. And uh, now Dr. Grinter will come up and talk about what if the Chinese really do invade Taiwan. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Very, very interesting. Um, let's, um, since I can't even handle this at all, let's, let's go ahead and put my briefing up. And I'll call slide by slide. Next slide, please. Now, I know this is a disappointment to the military guys out here, but I can hear some of the civilians breathing a sigh of relief, okay? And I stole that directly from Chris Hammer, as you know. All right, next slide. So, we won't talk about if the Chinese will invade or not. We're not doing intentions uh, this morning. We may all have feelings about that, but let's just do capabilities and strategy and how they would operate if they decided to attack Taiwan. You know, analysis of intentions is very different from capabilities. Um, intentions analysis can be risky, value-colored, and I don't know anybody at Air University, I don't, who has access to the secret discussions or timetables uh, and possible attack scenarios within the Standing Committee in Beijing regarding Taiwan. So we won't do intentions. And intentions analysis can be uh, very wrong. Uh, it didn't seem to me that we thought Japan would attack uh, Pearl Harbor in 1941. We didn't think North Korea would invade South Korea. We didn't think the Chinese would come into North Korea. We didn't expect 160,000 communist uh, Vietnamese to hit South Vietnamese cities in 1968. Much of the Arab world, Europe, and the United States didn't think Saddam Hussein would invade Kuwait. Um, once we got there, we didn't expect that Saddam Hussein would have a multi-billion dollar nuclear weapons effort. And then we discovered his calutrons, uh, his centrifuges, and $10 billion worth of lies and deceptions. In, in 2003, the United States and many other governments did expect to find weapons of mass destruction, surprised again. And of course, in 2001, we didn't expect that terrorists 
would hijack commercial airliners and deliberately fly them into buildings, murdering 2,800 innocent people from 70 countries. So we're not trying to predict today whether China might attack Taiwan. Instead, as the warfighting department, we're looking at how they might attack Taiwan and whether the blue side might be able to blunt, stop, and return such an attack. Next slide, please. And then the next one. A Chinese attack on Taiwan. The conventional wisdom is out there. It says that the Chinese want peace and economic development and stability, that they need years of stability to catch up with the West, and that an armed attack on democratic Taiwan would ruin China's image. Thus, reserving the right to attack Taiwan is Chinese bluff and bluster. Or as Thomas Barnett writes in a book I think you've heard about called The Pentagon's New War, New Map, None, quote, none of the Pentagon scenarios about China make any sense. China wants the good life too much so to come to its worst impulses. Further, says Barnett, the Communist Party is bribing the PLA with just enough funds to keep them happily dreaming up war games of future conflict with the United States. Now, if you believe that, just close your eyes, go back for a nap for the next 25 minutes, because nothing I've got to say or this department's take on this today will have any relevance to you. Uh, but if, like the contrarian, you are somewhat skeptical of the globalist, globalization core gap view of how China fits, then you would note that the Chinese have been telling us that Taiwan is a core issue for them that they will forego the 2008 Olympics if necessary, that Taiwan belongs to the People's Republic of China and must be reunited with the mainland as one of those three historic tasks. Next slide. So if they decide to attack, how would they do it? What we see in the literature is the sketching out of two main scenarios, a surprise attack. You would call it the capture option carefully prepared beforehand with the objective of violently capturing and occupying Taiwan, for example, as the, as the PLA did with Tibet in 1951, or a sequenced campaign of escalating military coercion without necessarily invading and occupying the island, but with the objective of collapsing Taiwan's nerves so they would essentially sue for peace. Next slide. The capture scenario would have China already having put in motion a sustained military and logistics buildup, carefully concealed, with the objective of executing a future surprise attack while keeping, as Sun Tzu would have them do, Chinese diplomacy and behavior appearing reasonable. A surprise attack is attractive for a state which needs to compensate for certain military deficiencies or technical disadvantages. Deception operations go hand in hand with surprise, as would preemption, or as the Chinese call it, swift action and hidden efforts. And of course, the PLA's military strategy of active defense remains deliberately vague and ambiguous about how the Chinese, whether they would wait to be attacked or would attack first. Now, the conventional wisdom says that even if China wanted to attack Taiwan, they lack the military means to carry off the attack. But the Russell article for today says, think again. Think as Sun Tzu would think. What if they are building and concealing numerous additional troop ships, have arrangements to draft hundreds of junks and maritime craft, have been falsifying the inventory and numbers of their sea lift and airlift and keeping them in hidden shelters. What if they've trained 30 to 40 to 50,000 parachute and soft forces, placed some of them already on the island instead of the 15,000 under training on the mainland that we assume? What if they have and intend to have 2,000 uh, SRBMs instead of the documented 550? What if they are using the routine and enlarging exercises every year 
as training cover for an eventual jump off. What if, as Russell states, that what the outside world actually knows of China's military assets may be just the tip of the iceberg? So whether a surprise attack came for purposes of capture or laying on just enough shock and awe to break the will in Taipei, that would be the surprise scenario. Again, the uh, Russell article. Next slide. The sequenced attack, the phased Chinese coercive approach. The conventional wisdom says the Chinese would not use force in a sequenced incremental fashion. It would give Taiwan and the United States too much time to react. But the contrarian says, think again. What if PLA strategists are designing a coercive military strategy combined with diplomatic and economic inducements to Taiwanese, i.e. 500,000 Taiwanese already working on the mainland? What if they're doing this in a way that on a jump off might just focus under the U.S. response threshold? Or would push just far enough to achieve the fait accompli? Or what if they would plan to attack when the U.S. is diverted? Or when it might only have one carrier battle group in PACOM because it was using another carrier battle group to backfill somewhere else? That sounds familiar. Again, the conventional wisdom is the Chinese won't experiment with escalation because, for example, PLA missile launches in 1995 and 96 failed to reverse Taiwan's move towards democratic elections. But the contrarian notes that those missile launches designed to coerce, to traumatize, to upset and destabilize, while not directly hitting Taiwan, produced a net outflow of $14 billion from the Taiwan stock market as money fled. And we know that signaling and mixing force with diplomacy and testing is something the Chinese clearly have done in the past. Whether the signaling in Korea in 1950, in October, and again in November, or the displays and warnings towards India in 1962, or the warnings before the punitive campaign with Vietnam in 1979, or the land grabbing in the South China Sea, or the penetration of the Taiwan Straits in 1999, or possibly in the future where the alliances would be attacked, the enemy alliances with warnings to Japan and the Philippines don't support American combat operations out of your bases. So I don't think we can rule out the sequenced signaling campaign either, which would be accompanied with a variety of statements and movements, largely non-kinetic, but clearly intentional. Such an escalating sequence kind of scenario would be designed to reverse threatening trends, to create chaos or turmoil on Taiwan, perhaps even a breakdown in which patriots were then invited to join in the greater China scenario. Next slide. Whether you align with the surprise or capture scenario or the sequenced or coercion scenario, what would be the guiding principles of a Chinese attack on Taiwan? First of all, as Sun Tzu would say, don't attack the cities and keep the war damage limited since killing the Taiwan goose that lays the golden eggs is not in China's interest. Secondly, keep the conflict brief and control escalation. If China attacks, they would need a quick win. The Americans are out there, and they would need to get it done as quickly as possible. Third, keep operational constraints manageable and orchestrated to China's advantage. We could expect the Chinese to mix conventional and asymmetrical forces, stealth operations, information operations, 
managing their resources and their resupply tempos to feed the Taiwan attack objective. Next slide. Here, then, are the aspects, and next slide, please. Here are the aspects, then, of what a multifaceted attack might take. I have no idea, if it happened, what the mixture would be in the priorities. I'm just going to lay the four out for you. You work that in your own minds. First, next slide, destabilization operations. I think some of them are already in motion. For example, information and disinformation warfare attacks, probably the placing of soft agents already on the island, Certainly some computer attacks have already occurred on key communications banks and so on. You would probably see uh, harassment of commercial shipping and or air traffic, uh, calls for the liberation from Taiwanese patriots, more ballistic missile tests, perhaps seizure of offshore islands like Kimin or Matsu, maybe the declaration of the Taiwan Strait as internal Chinese water. Then moving from harassment and destabilization to conventional military operations. Next slide, please. They probably wouldn't call, and the next one, they probably wouldn't call the uh, blockade a blockade. That's uh, war in international law. They would call it a quarantine. And here would be the effort to deny resupply and support from the outside. Taiwan is heavily dependent uh, on resupply. It is consuming a third of a very large oil tanker's crude oil every day, 250,000 uh, tons of crude oil every day. A Chinese blockade of western ports on Taiwan is more feasible than on the eastern coast, since PLAN activities around China's eastern shores would, of course, extend them, open them up, make them targets, assuming we came in. Blockades are risky. They, they take time to set up. They're highly visible. But the blockade could be combined with uh, submarine actions of various kinds. They have 60 diesel submarines. And they have on order, as you know, more and more of the Kilo-class submarines, real warfighting platforms, as well as the sovereignty destroyers. It's interesting that they are studying guerrilla warfare at sea. Uh, guerrilla attacks using irregular forces such as junk ships as well as elements of China's civilian fleet. Uh, next slide, please. Should they opt for a more explicit high-profile naval air blockade of Taiwan, area denial assets would come into play naturally. This would again be kilos and sovereignties. This is, these are anti-access platforms. Uh, the sovereignty itself is a real offensive uh, firing system. It has... Uh, the sea skimming anti-ship missiles, the Sunburn SSN-22s, they'll probably, the total buy on that is eight uh, sovereignty destroyers with um, 12 kilo class. That's spread out over about a seven-year buy. Expensive. It's enough, comments retired Rear Admiral Eric McVaden, to make the U.S. 7th Fleet certainly think twice. In the naval action, of course, the Chinese would have the advantage of hitting first, fighting close to their bases, until and if repeated U.S. and Iraq AF air strikes took their toll. Next slide. And the next one. To take Taiwan by force would, first of all, require air superiority. Here, I would assume they, since they have 3,000 combat-capable aircraft, they would probably throw the junk in first that is the second and third generation MiG-23s, MiG-25s, to bleed off ROCAFs, uh, AMRAMs, and Sidewinders, and then send in the uh, SU-27s, the SU-30s for the air superiority kill. Um, the Pentagon reports that China has a large fleet of between 600 and 650 military and civilian landing craft. The Chinese would face obstacles, nevertheless. The western side of Taiwan is not particularly hospitable. Uh, large mud flats extending two to five miles out to sea, as well as monsoon seasons. They would be looking for a particular time of the year and uh, talk to our, our colleague, uh, Colonel Liu, from Taiwan. He's doing an exquisite study on that, and he's looking at a variety of Chinese strategies, timing and tempo, and so on. 
The net effect, again, writes Bernard Cole regarding invasion and blockade, is that the Beijing is building a navy capable of decisively influencing the operational aspects of the Taiwan situation should diplomacy, other instruments of statecraft fail. And then the next slide, please. A missile attack. Probably the starkest option for Beijing, but again, this depends on targeting and CEPs. But presumably, in concert with an invasion, would be a ballistic and cruise missile attack launched from Fujian and Jiangxi provinces against Taiwan's principal land targets, air bases, and naval facilities, while attacking the enemy alliance by holding Japanese and possibly Filipino bases and support hostage to PLA MRBM missile threats. China's SRBM buildup has been steady and ominous. We think they may have 600 on their way to maybe 1,800 uh, MR, uh, SRBMs. Very poor targeting at this point. CEPs are about at 1,500 meters. That's unclassified. But they're trying to squeeze it down. So in a sense, it's an area weapon. But multiple area weapons laid down on finite targets would give you the kind of destruction, at least against airfields and ports, that presumably PLA planners would be interested in. If China launched SRBM attacks against Taiwan, I presume they would try to spare Taiwanese population centers, possibly because of fear of ROCAF or U.S. retaliation against Chinese cities. Interestingly, very senior level Taiwan officials have recently been talking publicly now about holding Chinese cities and the Three Gorges Dam hostage if China attacked. Next slide. So we get into the question, and then the next one. We get into the question then of what would be U.S. and ROC reactions. And the fundamental question, again, is how well, from our side, is the Air Force and the Navy positioned, configured, and supported to challenge a Chinese attack on Ty Taiwan? We now have one carrier in uh, PACOM. What if it was all the way down at uh, Australia, for example, rather than in the South China Sea or the East China Sea? What if U.S. operations were denied out of Japan and the Philippines, uh, but maybe just offensive combat operations, thus allowing for reconnaissance and support functions to still be permitted out of Kadena, out of, uh, let's say, Clark and Luzon. That would simplify things for carrier operations. I assume the carriers would be the first to have to try to blunt this attack. My, f my friends in um, DFW have uh, counseled me and they've told me that carrier operations conducting extensive strike packages into the strike strait would need underway replenishment every three to five days during operations. If Manila and Tokyo denied all basing support to the U.S., then support and recce would probably have to fall back to Guam or Singapore. That's 1,300 plus nautical miles before you get up to the carrier, which would probably be in the South China Sea. If, however, they allowed resupply and uh, support and recce, that makes it a lot easier. We have put B-52s at Guam. Conceivably, we might bring B-1s and B-2s into Guam as well. They could bring precise JDAM and ALCAM weapons to bear on a Chinese attack. But the whole operation, obviously, would be much easier and much more gratifying if Japanese bases and Philippine and Singapore bases stayed open or were offered. If, Chinese for, if Taiwanese forces could not hold out, could the U.S. get enough kinetic interdiction onto PLAF, PLAAN assets hitting Taiwan before a secure bridge had been established across the strait? The answer is dependent, a good Air Force term, on how fast the Chinese moved, the degree of surprise, where U.S. forces were in the region at the time in the context and how our friends and allies participated. It would be a race against time. Another issue, would we choose to hit mainland facilities supporting the attack? Facilities 
owned by a country with nuclear weapons? It's an interesting question. And finally, of course, if the challenge of how and if Washington decided to fight together with Taipei, wouldn't we need secure war fighting links that would have to be in place for the synchronization of actions, deconfliction of assets, electronic identification of friend and foe, the jamming and disruption of PRC communications, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets supporting the attack? So those are some of the principal blue team questions that might go into this kind of a scenario. I assume that deterring a Chinese attack on Taiwan remains a principal goal of Washington and Taipei, and also the Pacific Command in Hawaii. But the situation in the Taiwan Strait is not static. It is in flux, and it requires continued attention, planning, and coordination by Washington and Taipei, as long as the People's Republic of China refuses to renounce the use of force regarding the Taiwan question. Shall we take a 10-minute break? 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, folks, let's go ahead. Whoop, I'll turn it on. Turn it on. Okay, go. <clears throat> All right, we're, uh, we're as ready as any two men can be. <laughs> Questions, please. Cash. Cassandra Salvatore, Thirsty 13. About a week and a half ago when the State Department rep, I had stood up and asked a question based on Colin Powell's statement that he had made to the Chinese, that which is a little bit more harsh than what we usually have in our ambiguous policy, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. It was a topic of conversation out in Hawaii as well. I was out there last week um, at a PACOM theater security planning conference, all the DATs from all over PACOM were there, from Mongolia to Malagasy. And everybody was talking uh, at one point about that comment. Apparently the secretary who'd made a round-the-world trip and who probably has jet lag as bad as I do had used the term uh, reunification rather than resolution of the issue. That is interpreted now uh, in the U.S. and government as having misspoken. The, uh, the comment, and uh, if he'd been a junior diplomat, I'm sure he would have been fired. The comment about uh, Taiwan is not a country, not a sovereign country, I personally felt it would have been a more diplomatic to have said, uh, in the American, we do not recognize the Taiwan government as a sovereign country. Now, what's the background to this? If it can be put together, there's, there's two or three explanations. Number one, he was very tired, he had jet lag. Number two, it was part of a thought through series of comments, public and private, 
to both sides, but in this case in particular to Taipei and the DPP government and particularly President Chen Shui-bian, who has been pushing the envelope and the edge. The third version is that uh, we're backfilling everything we've got into the Middle East. We're already drawing a bead, I think, on Pyongyang and Tehran. We really don't need a dust-up in the Taiwan Strait. Pick your choice of explanations. I think uh, something in there is probably the truth. <laughs> Next. Yes. Yeah. Ben Carl Torrance, Seminar 14. What are the uh, U.S. interests in defending Taiwan? I didn't hear it. What are U.S. interests? Why would the U.S. defend Taiwan? Why would the U.S. defend Taiwan? Well, I think this is for uh, Dr. Stein and me both. <laughs> and I think somebody's writing a PSP on that, by golly. Why, why would they defend? Why would they not defend Taiwan? Let me pitch it right back to you. If, we, if, the, if there was a Chinese attack and we did not defend Taiwan, questioner, what would be the implications for the United States' East Asian security? Yeah, Walmart goes down. <laughs> what, what would be some of the other, uh, other uh, implications of not defending? Well, you already graded the paper I wrote on not defending them. <laughs> what would be some of the other uh, implications of not defending? So I, I'm interested in, uh, in I mean, I'm, I'm writing my PSP on, on how it's in our national interest, but it's, so far it's in a, a very idealistic yeah. Form and, uh, and looking at it in a realistic approach and how we're engaged in the rest of the world, yeah. um, what are the reasons that we would rush to their defense? Well, you can go through the usual set of pros and cons, but I think Colonel Liu is going to talk. And I've, <laughs> I've been waiting on this. <laughs> and, and talk Colonel about Liu. a PSP. He's really got one rolling now. Colonel Liu from Taiwan, Seminar 3. Uh, first, I want to answer the case uh, question uh, about the Secretary of State Colin Powell's statement. I have uh, two strategic implications and one risk. The two in, uh, strate strategic in, uh, implication first, it's a wake up call to wake up our pres uh, President Chen's uh, independence dreams. Second is the United States is paving the way for Taiwan and China for ne uh, to negotiation in the next few years, maybe 2005 or 2006. The risk is this statement is easy to let the PRC leader thinking the United States will not intervene the Taiwan Strait crisis. Here is the evidence. In my understanding, Bush administration sent some scholar and the think tank to Taiwan in September 2004. That's two months ago. Their job is to do some in investigation and assessment about Taiwan's government policy. In their final report, say that Taiwan President Chen is crossing the red line. That's the reason why. And the easy to trigger Taiwan's trade crisis. Therefore, power's statement is kind of balance of power to the one China policy. About the United States one, pan, one China policy, the strategic approach is uh, ambiguity. You will see some balance power on one China policy. You can examine, for example, you can examine last four years. Bush, President Bush support Taiwan very much. Taiwan Air Force can get uh, F-16, B, uh, BVR, MRN, AGM-65, G model, and the Hapong Air uh, Missile, and the GPS, new technology, and the, our F-16 GPS can get the 
satellite signal as send the Air, uh, United States Air Force. And uh, in the next uh, few years, uh, in the future, and we can get a link 16 in this uh, submarine too. So the statement, the risk, is uh, easy to let the PRC leader thinking, because uh, for the one China policy, the ambiguity is led the China to to thinking uh, to guess whether United States will in intervene the Taiwan Strait crisis or not. This is kind of a straight, uh, strategy. Finally, I, I want to say that Taiwan is a political entity, but we have sovereignty because we have own military force, territory, constitution, and especially we have 23 million people who love peace, freedom, and democracy. <coughs> And we hoped Taiwan's trade crisis result in peace, freedom, sure. and uh, democracy. <laughs> and the second question for why United States defend uh, for, for Taiwan. In my perspective, if PRC take over Taiwan, who is the next? You must say. Japan. Philippines, Thailand, right? And the PRC can intercept the first island chain to the second island chain and the near to the Hawaii. And uh, if you want to recover the same status, the United States will pour more resource, more energy to, to keep the original regional development. This is my understanding. Thank you. Can, can I take a moment? I want to ask George Stein a, a question related to Chinese uh, approach and the Dow they're using towards Taiwan. George, they, they have a multifaceted approach towards the island from what I can tell now. This briefing I gave, of course, is essentially a kinetic briefing uh, with an attack. But are they using other instruments, and are they using an approach towards Taiwan that is more multifaceted and more in keeping with what you've been talking about? Oh, yeah. Um, remember that <clears throat> the goal would be to take Taiwan intact. The second largest Chinese country in Southeast Asia is not Taiwan. It's the overseas Chinese community that's spread out in Indonesia and out, all over the place. That's a battle space. Both Taiwan and the P PRC compete for loyalty. They also... Um, uh, very actively. They, all, they, they, they compete for where the investment will come. Uh, the, China, the mainland Chinese have made it very easy for Taiwanese businesses to move to China to make money. Uh, the Taiwanese are stuck with the situation that if they let the mainland come in in a big way, the mainland will buy Taiwan. And so the situation is such where the investment capital goes from Taiwan to the mainland. There's an economic component to it. There is a very, very active info war in our sense, in the, in the U.S. sense of computer network attack, computer network defense, sparring going on between uh, both sides all the time. And, of course, you know, all around the world, there are little competitions for is, is little country X going to uh, recognize Taiwan or is it going to recognize the PRC? I mean, I think it's, I was really surprised that our Republican right-wing friends haven't gone into an absolute frenzy uh, about the arrival of a couple hundred Chinese policemen in Haiti. 
uh, as part of the UN mission. Now, the interesting thing is that Haiti recognizes Taiwan. I suspect when this is over, another country will no longer recognize Taiwan, but recognize China. Uh, we see China yesterday announcing, um, or day before yesterday announcing that Iran, you don't have a thing to worry about. We will never let this question get to the UN Security Council. You can count on us to keep Iran safe from the Security Council. Why? Oil. It's, you know, go back and, go back and look at geography. This, so this, de this debate that, you know, Buck and I have over lunch and, and other, other faculty and students have, you know, between the, the red menace crowd and the panda huggers crowd, right, <laughs> is a real, genuine debate we need to have. We cannot afford to be ignorant of developments. How we judge the developments, you know, red menace or big market for American toothpaste or something, that kind of depends on your politics. But, but is the region in play? Quite clearly. Right now, China has, to use a historic phrase that got somebody else in trouble before, China's economic behavior throughout that whole region might be best described as the attempt to create a greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere uh, in which they will be the dominant player, not us. Yeah, I, um, I used to put on my Chinese thinking cap, and um, it bombed just like it did then. So they sent me back to Beijing and said, look, try something else. And I'm still working the system, you know. I can't figure out whether I'm a panda hugger or a, or a panda hater. I think I'm an in-between somewhere. That's a Manchu hat, so the Chinese wouldn't like it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Yes, ma'am. Coming from the panda huggers. Um, Senator Colonel Martha Fever, Solid 17. Question for you. If you go to the Barnett uh, philosophy of China shouldn't be the problem, it should be the prize and the active military should be an active part in turning a, instead of a would-be enemy into a would-be friend, open with uh, economic and the follow-on benefits of that. What do we do in the military to take an active part instead of waiting for the enemy to actually make it then the, not the problem, but the pride? Huh. I hate Barnett. No. I, <laughs> he, take, he takes away my enemy, you know. I, I mean, um, let me just put it to you this way. It, when you peel down all the layers and try to go down through that very interesting book and that very interesting presentation, I think what you've got there is an economist and a globalization theorist. Something is wrong when I place China up against that template. Here's what's wrong. Weapons for oil in the Middle East with rogue states. Proliferation from China to Pakistan to North Korea to AQ Khan in the midst of this. The creation of the Pakistani bomb. the uh, attempt to constantly counterpose or complicate American interests and objectives. Countless light arms to Africa. So, something doesn't ring core to me yet about that government. Because I, I think when you look at China, when you analyze China, you must always differentiate between public policy and operational behavior. So <clears throat> I'm not at the point yet where I think, and then talk to the DATS about how they, uh, about attempting to get transparency and reciprocity with the PLA. 
You know, I, one time we were badgering the Chinese. I don't mind doing that. We were badgering them in Beijing about lack of transparency, lack of reciprocity. And they lost their temper. And one went, look, you Americans can read our license plates from 30,000 feet. Aren't we entitled to some secrets? <laughs> yeah, you are, yeah. I don't see it as a core country. But uh, that's me. George, also on this? I think that one of our most important assets, military strategic assets, is our current domination of space. And, and the C4ISR that, that, that our space domination makes possible. Uh, it is clear that the Chinese are developing counter space weapons. It might be in our interest, whether we want to take it from a panda hugger approach or a red menace approach, is to maybe we should push like the International Space Station with the Chinese, right? force the Chinese into the internationalization of space. Otherwise, we're going to get an arms race there. And that's, that's just, that, that's just one, of the, one of the things coming. And who wants an arms race in space? Right? We like it the way it is. We run space. <laughs> so, so it is not, in, my, in my mind, it is not inevitable that there will be a war in China. But I keep remembering one thing in all of this. At one time, the most developed, the most highly educated, the most scientifically sophisticated, the most culturally developed with symphonies and operas and all that stuff, country in the world went nuts in 1930 and decided to reorganize and decided to reorganize themselves and the planet on the basis of racial. The fact is that countries can change and intentions can change and can change quickly. So, what's the motto of the class this year? Give more a chance. Come on. If you want peace, prepare for war. Okay, let's go upstairs and uh, discuss peer red teams.